Good morning. Hope you have uh, had a terrific week, whatever your circumstances might have been. And I hope this morning as you've been here, we talked a little bit about this last week. I hope this morning as you're here, you've come to worship uh, and give back to God. Again, we've talked over and over again about how as we worship, sometimes we think about coming to church thinking about what am I going to get? What, what, what is it that I'm going to get out of this? And it's not that there's nothing to get out of this, but in our purpose of life, of living our lives and then gathering together as believers, we are here this morning to honor our Lord and Savior. And so I, I don't want us to forget that as we go through uh, this morning. We're giving back to him through our singing, through our tithes and offerings, or looking into his word of saying our life, our whole life is committed to him, and, and here's a special time as believers when we gather together to give back to him. Wanted to uh, thank a uh, young man who, uh, you know, each week the, the, there are kids among us, right? Uh, our children's church goes up through kindergarten, and then first grade through these are our youth, but our kids through sixth grade, uh, they're here, and uh, they have a, there's a sermon notes for the kids, and they can uh, write something or draw something. And one of the young men, uh, he drew a picture on the back of the sheet, and he had, we talked about the Christ acrostic, right? He took the time, he looked at the bulletin and saw all the different pictures and drew pictures of, of all the individual uh, symbols that go with those six uh, phrases that we have as our goals, our desires as we choose to be disciples, which just encouraged me to think, man, we need to continue to promote that and encourage our young people to, uh, to learn, even memorize these six things. What does it mean to be a disciple? Well, if I think of the Christ acrostic, I know it's these six things that I'm wanting to strive to allow God to work in my life. So if you're in here this morning and you're between the ages of first grade and sixth grade, Okay, I, I want to encourage you, I want to challenge you to be memorizing those things. And uh, there are five weeks in uh, the month of March. And uh, just want to encourage you to be memorizing those. Starting next week, come and tell me th these six things, what Christ stands for as, as we have our goals here uh, as, uh, as a church. And I, I got a little something for you. Okay, so it's not that I don't have anything for you. I got something for you. Uh, there's bonus points. Bonus points don't really mean anything. There's like 5,000 bonus points if you also draw these, okay? But uh, if you memorize them, I have something for you. The drawing, that's just a little bit on, the, on this extra. So can you guys do that? Perhaps? All right. No big commitment out of them yet, but we'll see. Also, wanted to uh, just bring to your attention, maybe you've heard about the uh, series, the TV series that's being done tonight. Uh, first of all, at 6.30 is a great opportunity to remind you we have our prayer time here 6 30 to 7 30 but also after that after you're done uh going home at seven o'clock on the history channel for the next five weeks okay so throughout the month of of march again there is uh the series called the bible from seven to nine o'clock on the history channel and uh, the producer of that is uh, mark burnett I heard, actually, we were at the basketball games last night up in, in Abilene, and on our way home uh, on the Christian radio station, they were interviewing him, talking about this, and, and he just uh, talked about how it was the most important story that there is uh, on this planet, and uh, that that was w part of what encouraged him to do this, uh, this five-week series on, on the Bible. And so uh, he's, Mark Burnett, you might know the name, he's also the guy who did... Uh, Survivor, I believe it is. So if they start voting people off each week, I'm going for Team Jesus. I'm just saying. I'm, that's where I'm putting it. Also, uh, just also want to mention, uh, as you look through those prayer requests that we have listed there in your bulletin, um, take those out. We have those there in the bulletin, not just for this morning, during our, our time of sharing, for you to be able to, to write down the prayer requests that we have, but also to encourage you, take those home with you, have them in your Bible, put them on your fridge, be praying for those. Uh, I had the opportunity to, to uh, have lunch this past week with uh, Richard and Wanda Harms, and uh, we have listed in there uh, Richard Harms, and, and he's dealing with uh, Lou Gehrig's disease. Difficult, difficult disease. 
that's impacting uh, their family. And we, we just want to encourage you to continue to lift them up in prayer. And I know there's many other prayer requests as well that, uh, that are in there and that we can have in there. But um, obviously, prayer requests connect to real people and real situations. And uh, we just want to be encouraging you to be praying for them and, and lifting them up in prayer as well. As we begin, let's turn our hearts to God and, and pray once again and ask him to be with us. Heavenly Father, we have come through a variety of things this past week. We thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, it, it all hasn't been easy. We've been disappointed. We've been hurt. Lord, we ask that this morning as we're here giving back to you, we trust you as you provide for us. We cannot do this thing called the Christian life in our own power. So many times, Lord, we do that. So many times we we search after our own ways. Lord, we need not only this body of believers, but throughout the week, we need others. We need your word. We need your spirit to be with us, to be encouraging us, to be helping us. Lord, we, we come before you as sinners. We ask for your forgiveness. We thank you that it's available through your son, Jesus Christ, for that personal relationship that we can have with you. Speak to us this morning, Lord, through your word. We ask this all in your name. Amen. Intimacy. As I have talked to individuals leading up to this morning, the question becomes, what exactly are you going to talk about about being intimate? We have children present. Or am I going to be embarrassed? Well, we're not going to talk about it just this week. We're going to talk about it for three weeks, okay? So prepare yourself, whatever that means. But intimacy is at the center of, e of who each and every one of us are, who God has called us to be. We started by talking about this a little bit last week when we were going through the Christ acrostic. One of the letters is the letter I. We talked about intimate worship. It comes out of this verse in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, which says, Jesus replied when he was asked, what is the greatest commandment of all the things that we are told to do, which one's the most important? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. All of who we are, all of who God created you to be, that's the most important thing, to be intimate with him. That's the greatest commandment. But really, what does that word intimate mean? Our world gives us a lot of different definitions. As you think about intimacy, probably even a lot of different pictures come to your mind, thoughts come to your mind of what it means to be intimate. If you look in the dictionary, and I encourage you, if, you have, if you're taking notes, write these three things down. We're going to be talking about intimacy uh, throughout the morning, and like I said, throughout the next three weeks, we'll be going back to these. It's important to have this part of this as, as the foundation that we're going from. But to be intimate is to have a close familiarity. It talks about the inmost part or the essential nature is to be intimate. I, as I think about those three definitions, I, I think about what's, what's at the center of my heart? What's at the center of your, art, your heart? We don't always like to go there. When we think about what the center of our heart is, it's, it's vulnerable. It's, it's the part of our heart that sometimes gets hurt. But it's our essential nature. And the Bible talks about this. If you have your, if you have your Bible, and there's, there, there's one there in your row, uh, turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. Throughout Scripture, not only when Christ talked about this in in Matthew 22, but throughout Scripture, God talks about intimacy. And as he created us, and as Adam and Eve interacted with God, we see a picture, we see an example 
of how things work in our hearts and how they worked in theirs. God created Adam and Eve, and in verse 1 of chapter 3, it says this, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? We're not told how long it was between when God created Adam and Eve and when Satan came as a serpent and talked to them and tempted Eve. But Satan, in his question to Eve, asked, did God really say you can't eat from the tree? And not just the tree, but it says from any tree that's in the garden. He questions what God said. Verse 2, we see Eve's response. The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. Eve says, Not only are we not supposed to eat from that tree, that one tree, but if we touch it, we will die. We can eat from any of the trees except for that one. Well, what is it really that God said? Because we have what Satan said in verse 1. We have what Eve says in verse 2. But let's go back to Genesis chapter 2 and look at verses 16 to 17. And in those verses we see God speaking to Adam and giving him the actual instructions. And in Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 to 17, it says, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. What are the differences as you look at those? Satan questioning, did God really say it? to begin with, and then questioning, is it any tree, or is it one specific tree? Eve had part of it right, didn't she? She knew that there was one particular tree. She knew that if she did eat of that tree, or as she said, even touch it, that she would die. So she was close, and she knew the consequences. Adam had passed them on to her. But notice Satan's response to Eve after she responded to his question. Satan said, you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and and evil. Satan doesn't have any different tactics today than he did back then. He says to Eve, he's not telling you the truth. You're not going to die. You don't need to listen to what God has to say. He lied to her straight up. You're not going to die. In fact, God's holding out on, holding out on you, isn't he? He's keeping something from you. God knows that if, if you eat from this tree, it's going to benefit you. It's actually good for you to eat from this tree. It's completely opposite of what God has said to you. Are you going to trust him in what he says? He's holding out on you. God knows that if you eat from that tree, your eyes are going to be opened. God's selfish, and he doesn't want you to be like him. He's keeping this from you. At this point, just for clarification, has Eve sinned yet? What do you think? So many times we, we talk about temptation and about the thoughts perhaps that go through our head, our desires that we have. Temptation Again, write this down because I'm asked about this each and every time. Temptation is not sin. 
Okay, Satan coming to you, or other people coming to you, the world offering you things that are different from what God has instructed, instructed is not sin. We're tempted all the time. You've been tempted since you got up this morning to do different things. That isn't necessarily sin, is it? Sin takes place when we follow through and do those things. Or mentally as we stay focused on those things. But look at what Eve did. Verse 6. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. The woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good. And that it was good for what? It was good for food. It was good to eat. It looked good. It wasn't one of those fruits you're wondering, what in the world's going on there? I don't want anything to do with that fruit. Papaya, maybe. Just sounds like something you wouldn't want to eat. But not only that, it's desirable for gaining wisdom. As she... As she looked at that, can't you see the wheels turning, justifying, hey, I need to eat. And there's this fruit that can meet that need. And not only that, it it looks good. It's shiny. Maybe it's red or bright green or whatever that color is that you want a fruit to look like. But it looked good. And I can get smarter. There's, there's, There's something for me to be gained in this. Maybe he's right. Maybe God is holding out on me. He, Satan uses her needs to his advantage. He gets her thinking that she knew better than God and that she could truly be the best one to decide what's best for her. So it says that she ate it and that Adam as well ate it with her. Verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Remember back, what was it that they were told? God is lying. If you eat of the fruit, your eyes are going to be opened. He told her the truth. Their eyes were opened, it says here. But all of a sudden, besides their eyes being opened, right, there's this, we're naked? When did this happen? How long has this been going on and we didn't know about this? It would be quite frightening in your life if you realized that today, wouldn't it? Think about it. They dove in the bushes, it says. Probably away from one another. That's Brad's interpretation. But they sewed leaves together. They were ashamed. There was a realization that came over them that had to do with the way they looked outwardly, it would appear, that they needed to cover up. Satan had told them, God's holding out on you. You can't trust him. You need to know and experience this for yourself as to whether or not it's true. And God was right. Once they realized, it says here, that there was a difference in their gender. There was a new awareness. They were not the same. We are not the same ever since. Hold on to that thought as we go into verses 8 and 9. It says, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? What was the other consequence that took place? Their eyes were opened. They realized that they were naked and were ashamed of that. And it says they did what? It says that they hid. It says that they hid. Why is it that they hid? Verse 10, Adam answered, 
I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Third result of the lie that Satan had told them was that they hid. They were afraid. Pat and Susan were just in Costa Rica. They shared a little bit about that this morning. I don't know if my parents went to the same school, but I got to go to kindergarten in Costa Rica. Uh, my parents were preparing to go to the Dominican Republic again for uh, either their second, I believe it was for their second term. And so uh, I, I was, we were living in Bluffton, Ohio at the time. I, was, I remember being, the day that they took me out of class, uh, my kindergarten class there uh, in Bluffton Elementary. And uh, I got, in fact, they gave me the book that we were going through and they told me what was gonna happen in the weeks to come. It was pretty cool. Uh, that was a big deal when you're a kindergartner, right? You get to finish the book early. Got on a plane, went to Costa Rica. They took me to my new school there, and I, I didn't like it. In fact, I was telling Pat that I, I remember that day, I have that picture in my mind of going to, of going to school, and, and I was scared, and I didn't want to be there. I wanted to be back. I wanted to be back home. So one of the days after school, I thought, you know what? My parents need to know and understand uh, that I don't want to be here. So I hid. Okay? It's great in another country, right, when your kids hide from you. Don't do that. There were some bushes, and it was, seemed to me that it was either on a corner or uh, down this, uh, there was a sidewalk that ran right by it. Because I, I stood there in the bushes, or crouched down in the bushes, and I remember hearing people running by calling my name and you know when you first start hiding it's a great idea and it's fun but you know especially even as a little kid how long can you stay hiding in the bushes right you, you can't stay there forever and then that fear comes across you right well, what's going to happen when uh, I step out of the bushes and I have to go to my parents and I have to tell them I've been hiding from them. Fortunately, I can't remember any of those things, right? I have a pretty good idea, though. <laughs> but we hide, and there's fear. And what happens when we come out of the bushes? What happens when people, when God knows? And so we hide. We're afraid. Look at verse 11. God speaks and says, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree I commanded you not to eat from? Who told you you were naked? Have, have you eaten? Did you go and eat from the one tree? I gave you all these trees. Ten trees, hundred trees, thousands of trees. All of them. He, they could eat from all of them except for that one. Did you go and eat from that one tree? Parents. You know what it's like, right, when you know the answer to the question before you ask, right? See lots of you smiling. Giving your children the opportunity to take ownership and say, yes, I did it, right? No excuses. If we would read on in here, you know the story, right? Eve says it's, or Adam says it's Eve's fault. Eve says it's the serpent's fault. The blame game starts. Again, we know that a little bit too well in our own lives. God gives them, though, the opportunity to take ownership. How did you know you were naked? And as we see here, and as we, we're going to take a look at another passage here in, in Genesis chapter 4, this knowing, this knowing of, of what was going on physically, that there were differences between a male and a female, were connected to the sin that they committed, the knowledge that they gained. Take a look at Genesis chapter 4 and verse 1. Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, just the next chapter, says, Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. If you have the King James Version, which I'm going to go to in this instance, it says, and you've probably heard this before, that it doesn't always talk about sex or making love in those terms. Many times it uses that word new. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived 
and bore Cain. So for, as we continue to talk about this, I will talk about Adam knowing Eve. And you know what I'm talking about, right? Okay. That word knew, if you look in the Hebrew language, okay, it's translated with a long A there, so that's yada. Okay, that's the word there that means Adam knew his wife. But if you turn back and look at Genesis chapter 3 and verse 7, and we'll read it again. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed leaves together and made coverings and made themselves covering. That word there, knew, in the Hebrew language, guess what? Same word. Same word. Now, most of the time when we would look at that and think about new, right, in, in chapter 4 and verse 1, we're thinking about probably purely something physical, aren't we? Because then it says that she conceived and she had a baby. We're talking about a physical act. That's where our minds go, doesn't it? And yet that same word that would take us there is also used for Adam and Eve knowing that they were naked. Adam intimately knew Eve in chapter 4 and verse 1, and she conceived. Just like Adam and Eve intimately knew that they were naked. Before I was married, I thought I knew what knowing a woman meant. Okay? Right? When I was 18 years old, perhaps, 19 years old, I thought I knew what that meant. And I knew part of it, correct? The physical of what it means to know a woman. However, we also know that it means much more than that as well, correct? At Grace, our, at Grace College of the Bible, Grace University now, up there in Omaha where I went to college, uh, I remember our, our, direct, our um, student life uh, supervisor he would come and talk to us as men and he would talk about his relationship with his wife and trust me he gave me way too much he gave us way too much information but i sat there and i thought of i thought and i remember thinking as an 18 and 19 year old sitting there uh you're 50 60 years old H how is that even how is that so amazing like you're talking about your relationship with your wife and and what that is and i'm just like you're you, you're way past that. Is that, that. Are you kidding me? However, as now I'm married, and as it's been about 21, 22 years, you realize that it's not just about the physical relationship. There's something about knowing, isn't there? Emotionally, spiritually, the, the person that you're with. It's more than just the physical. Are these both sexual acts that are being described? I don't think so, physically. But as we, as we look at these and think about what our relationship is now with God, that we are to love him with all of our hearts, with all of our souls, with all of our soul, and with all of our mind, we are called to know him intimately with all of who we are. In both situations, there's a connection between the heart and their gender and the vulnerability that takes place in a relationship. We're going to look at that more next week. And next week, if this week is difficult to talk about, man, as I've been preparing for next week, next week's at, 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 at even another level as we talk about not only our interpersonal relationships, but how that connects with who God is and, and who he's called us to be. But for this week, as as we go through the big lie, let me take you through this progression. Satan first came to them and told them the lie. Told Eve the lie. Eve considered it and sinned. Out of the sin came knowledge. From that knowledge, they made, they made coverings. They used leaves to cover themselves. And finally, it led, to, it led to hiding. It led to fear. It led to being afraid of who God is and the relationship that they, that they previously had. 
I would encourage you to think about the fact, does Satan work any different again today? Are his tactics any different? He comes to us with the big lie. Pretty general, but the idea that you can't trust God. His word, the things that he's called you to do, the people that he's called us to be, does he really know what we face, the needs that you have, the hurt that you've felt? Can I really trust him that he is who he said he's, that he said he is? And so we begin to question, and we begin to think, I know better than God. God doesn't know exactly what I'm going through. He doesn't know exactly what my needs are. I think I know, I think I know better. And so we follow that. And what tends, and what is at the end of that path? The knowledge. The knowledge that we don't. Sometimes when we sin, we, we get the consequences right away, or it dawns on us that, boy, I shouldn't have gone that, this direction. I'm out of line. Didn't see that coming. God does know what he's talking about. Other times, we can go for years thinking everything's fine. But when it all comes out, we work at covering it up, don't we? We try to hide it. Most of the time I think about it because, you know, we, we want to keep doing what we're currently doing, so if I cover it up, nobody's going to see. Nobody knows. And I think what keeps us in that spot, in fact, I'm, I'm pretty sure that what keeps us in that spot of the lie, the sin, the knowledge, and the shame so that we cover it up is we have the fear, don't we? What if somebody finds out? And if God really knows who I am, does he really love me? If other people found out, would they really know, love me and care about me? I've talked to you before about my issues with pornography, correct? From the age of 12 through about 16, 26, 27 years old, dealing with that. What kept me in that same cycle, not wanting anybody to know? Shame, first and foremost. But then the fear that, well, if I tell anybody, and here I am a missionary in Alaska, if they really know who I am, they're not going to love me. They're not going to care about me. They're going to discard me. Right? Nobody wants to be discarded. I have enough pain in my life without people knowing who I really am. Fear keeps us trapped right where we're at. If we're going to grow to be the church God's called us to be, if you're going to be the husband, the wife, children, boss, whatever term you define yourself by, we need to continue to go back to that first question of do we trust God? And so I'll leave you with this. I need you to answer this question and bring it back with you next week. You don't need to write it down. I just need you to answer it in your mind. I'm requesting that you answer this in your mind. What's the lie that you believe about God? Is it the one stated this morning? It might not be exactly like that. As I sit in my office thinking about that question, I was like, well, how do I even answer that question? And what's the lie that I believe about God? I don't, I don't believe any lies about God. I, I trust God. How about, when, how about when you're going to, when you're tempted to do whatever that is, lie, steal, yell at your spouse, disobey your parents, whatever it is. You fill in the blank yourself. When you're tempted to do that, why do you follow through in sin? What is it that you feel like you know better than what it is that God knows? Fill in that blank. Bring that back with you. Because it's going to affect the way we think about ourselves, not only with other people, but also obviously through God. Next week it's called, or we're going to be talking about a mistaken identity. We tend to walk around with an identity that God never intended us to have. And it's rooted in intimacy. It's rooted in how we view, how we view God, who we see him to be. I'm going to invite the worship team to come forward. As, as they're leading us in our closing song, I, I, and even as I'm praying here to, to close, I, I'm just going to invite you 
I'm going to invite you to, uh, to be thinking about that question. I'm going to leave some time for, for, uh, for silent prayer. Hopefully you'll pray about that, this not only this morning, but also through the, through the week, because you're going to have opportunities. You're going to be tempted. Be thinking about what is the lie that I believe about who God is. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we, we come before you. And uh, Lord, we know that in your word you describe yourself as light. So much in our life, we like to, to live and operate in darkness. It, it feels safe. We, we, feel like, we feel like we're protected by the darkness. It gives us comfort. And yet, Lord, you say that true freedom comes when, when we step into the light, when we're transparent, when we're exposed. Lord, that, that's so difficult. We, we admit that to you. Lord, we know that you're a good God, that the instructions you've given to us in your word are so that we might bring you honor and glory and so that others might know about who you are. Lord, that's the people we want to be. That's the people we strive to be like. Lord, I I know that that's rooted in in who we see ourselves to be before you. Lord, help us over these weeks as, as we study intimacy, as we think honestly about the trust that we have in you, about stepping out and, and obeying in ways we've never obeyed before even when it doesn't look right to us. Lord, help us to be people who know your word and do your word. But more than anything, Lord, help help us to truly understand who we are before you. Again, we thank you for your patience. And we ask this all in your name, amen. We invite you to use these steps as an altar to come and bring your prayer request to the Lord.